Chapter 3, Part A of The Wealth of Nations, Book 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Book 4, Chapter 3, Part A of the extraordinary restraints upon the importation of goods of almost all kinds from those countries with which the balance is supposed to be disadvantageous part one of the unreasonableness of those restraints even upon the principles of the commercial system to lay extraordinary restraints upon the importation of goods of almost all kinds from those particular countries with which the balance of trade is supposed to be disadvantageous is the second expedient by which the commercial system proposes to increase the quantity of gold and silver thus in great britain silicia lawns may be imported for home consumption upon paying certain duties but french cambrics and lawns are prohibited to be imported except into the port of london there to be warehoused for exportation higher duties are imposed upon the wines of france than upon those of portugal or indeed of any other country by what is called the impost sixteen ninety two a duty of five and twenty per cent of the rate or value was laid upon all french goods while the goods of other nations were the greater part of them subjected to much lighter duties seldom exceeding five per cent the wine brandy salt and vinegar of france were indeed accepted these commodities being subjected to other heavy duties either by other laws or by particular clauses of the same law in 1696, a second duty of 25%, the first not having been thought a sufficient discouragement, was imposed upon all French goods, except brandy. Together with a new duty of 5 and 20 pounds upon the ton of French wine, and another of 15 pounds upon the ton of French vinegar. French goods have never been omitted in any of those general subsidies or duties of 5%, which have been imposed upon all, or the greater part, of the goods enumerated in the books of rates. If we count the one-third and two-third subsidies as making a complete subsidy between them, there have been five of these general subsidies, so that, before the commencement of the present war, 75% may be considered as the lowest duty to which the greater part of the goods of the growth, produce or manufacture of france were liable but upon the greater part of goods those duties are equivalent to a prohibition the french in their turn have i believe treated our goods and manufactures just as heartily though i am not so well acquainted with the particular hardships which they have imposed upon them those mutual restraints have put an end to almost all fair commerce between the two nations and smugglers are now the principal importers either of British goods into France, or of French goods into Great Britain. The principles which I have been examining in the foregoing chapter took their origin from private interest and the spirit of monopoly, those which I am going to examine in this from national prejudice and animosity. They are, accordingly, as might well be expected, still more unreasonable. They are so even upon the principles of the commercial system. First, though it were certain that in the case of a free trade between france and england for example the balance would be in favour of france it would by no means follow that such a trade would be disadvantageous to england or that the general balance of its whole trade would thereby be turned more against it if the wines of france are better and cheaper than those of portugal or its linens than those of germany it would be more advantageous for great britain to purchase both the wine and the foreign linen which it had occasion for of france than of portugal and germany though the value of the annual importations from france would thereby be greatly augmented the value of the whole annual importations would be diminished in proportion as the french goods of the same quality were cheaper than those of the other two countries this would be the case even upon the supposition that the whole french goods imported were to be consumed in great britain but secondly a great part of them might be re-exported to other countries where being sold with profit they might bring back a return equal in value perhaps to the prime cost of the whole french goods imported what has frequently been said of the east india trade might possibly be true of the french that though the greater part of east india goods were bought with gold and silver the re-exportation of a part of them to other countries brought back more gold and silver to that which carried on the trade than the prime cost of the whole amounted to 
one of the most important branches of the Dutch trade at present, consists in the carriage of French goods to other European countries. Some part even of the French wine drank in Great Britain is clandestinely imported from Holland and Zealand. If there was either a free trade between France and England, or if French goods could be imported upon paying only the same duties as those of other European nations, to be drawn back upon exportation, England might have some share of a trade which is found so advantageous to Holland. Thirdly, and lastly, there is no certain criterion by which we can determine on which side what is called the balance between any two countries lies, or which of them exports to the greatest value. National prejudice and animosity, prompted always by the private interest of particular traders, are the principles which generally direct our judgment upon all questions concerning it. There are two criterions, however, which have frequently been appealed to upon such occasions, the custom-house books, and the course of exchange. The custom-house books, I think, it is now generally acknowledged, are a very uncertain criterion, on account of the inaccuracy of the valuation at which the greater part of goods are rated in them. The course of exchange is, perhaps, almost equally so. When the exchange between two places, such as London and Paris, is at par, it is said to be a sign that the debts due from London to Paris are compensated by those due from Paris to London. On the contrary, when a premium is paid at London for a bill upon Paris, it is said to be a sign that the debts due from London to Paris are not compensated by those due from Paris to London, but that a balance in money must be sent out from the latter place for the risk, trouble, and expense of exporting which the premium is both demanded and given. But the ordinary state of debt and credit between those two cities must necessarily be regulated, it is said, by the ordinary course of their dealings with one another. When neither of them imports from the other to a greater amount than it exports to that other, the debts and credits of each may compensate one another. But when one of them imports from the other to a greater value than it exports to that other, the former necessarily becomes indebted to the latter in a greater sum than the latter becomes indebted to it. The debts and credits of each do not compensate one another, and money must be sent out from that place of which the debts overbalance the credits. The ordinary course of exchange, therefore, being an indication of the ordinary state of debt and credit between two places, must likewise be an indication of the ordinary course of their exports and imports, as these necessarily regulate that state. But though the ordinary course of exchange shall be allowed to be a sufficient indication of the ordinary state of debt and credit between any two places, it would not from thence follow that the balance of trade was in favor of that place which had the ordinary state of debt and credit in its favor. The ordinary state of debt and credit between any two places is not always entirely regulated by the ordinary course of their dealings with one another, but is often influenced by that of the dealings of either with many other places. If it is usual, for example, for the merchants of England to pay for the goods which they buy of Hamburg, Danzig, Riga, etc., by bills upon Holland, the ordinary state of debt and credit between England and Holland will not be regulated entirely by the ordinary course of the dealings of those two countries with one another, but will be influenced by that of the dealings in England with those other places. England may be obliged to send out every year money to Holland, though its annual exports to that country may exceed very much the annual value of its imports from thence, and though what is called the balance of trade may be very much in favor of England. In the way, besides, in which the par of exchange has hitherto been computed, the ordinary course of exchange can afford no sufficient indication that the ordinary state of debt and credit is in favor of that country which seems to have, or which is supposed to have, the ordinary course of exchange in its favor. Or, in other words, the real exchange may be, and in fact often is, so very different from the computed one, that, from the course of the latter, no certain conclusion can, upon many occasions, be drawn concerning that of the former. When for a sum of money paid in England, containing, according to the standard of the English mint, a certain number of ounces of pure silver, you receive a bill for a sum of money to be paid in France, containing, according to the standard of the French mint, an equal number of ounces of pure silver, exchange is said to be at par between England and France. When you pay more, you are supposed to give a premium, and exchange is said to be against England and in favor of France, 
When you pay less, you are supposed to get a premium, and exchange is said to be against France and in favor of England. But first, we cannot always judge of the value of the current money of different countries by the standard of their respective mints. In some it is more, in others it is less worn, clipped, and otherwise degenerated from that standard. But the value of the current coin of every country, compared with that of any other country, is in proportion not to the quantity of pure silver which it ought to contain, but to that which it actually does contain. Before the reformation of the silver coin in King William's time, exchange between England and Holland, computed in the usual manner, according to the standard of their respective mints, was five and twenty per cent against England. But the value of the current coin of England, as we learn from Mr. Lowndes, was at that time rather more than five and twenty per cent below its standard value. The real exchange, therefore, may even at that time have been in favor of England, notwithstanding the computed exchange was so much against it. A smaller number, or ounces, of pure silver, actually paid in England, may have purchased a bill for a greater number of ounces of pure silver to be paid in Holland, and the man who is supposed to give may in reality have got the premium. The French coin was, before the late reformation of the English gold coin, much less worn than the English, and was perhaps two or three per cent nearer its standard. If the computed exchange with France, therefore, was not more than two or three per cent against England, the real exchange might have been in its favor. Since the reformation of the gold coin, the exchange has been constantly in favor of England and against France. Secondly, in some countries the expense of coinage is defrayed by the government. In others, it is defrayed by the private people, who carry their bullion to the mint, and the government even derives some revenue from the coinage. In England, it is defrayed by the government, and if you carry a pound weight of standard silver to the mint, you get back sixty-two shillings, containing a pound weight of the like standard silver. In France, a duty of eight per cent is deducted for the coinage, which not only defrays the expense of it, but affords a small revenue to the government. In England, as the coinage costs nothing, the current coin can never be much more valuable than the quantity of bullion which it actually contains. In France, the workmanship, as you pay for it, adds to the value, in the same manner as to that of wrought plate. A sum of French money, therefore, containing an equal weight of pure silver, is more valuable than a sum of English money containing an equal weight of pure silver, and must require more bullion or other commodities to purchase it. Though the current coin of the two countries, therefore, were equally near the standards of their respective mints, a sum of English money could not well purchase a sum of French money containing an equal number of ounces of pure silver, nor, consequently, a bill upon France for such a sum. If, for such a bill, no more additional money was paid than what was sufficient to compensate the expense of the French coinage, the real exchange might be at par between the two countries. Their debts and credits might mutually compensate one another, while the computed exchange was considerably in favor of France. If less than this was paid, the real exchange might be in favor of England, while the computed was in favor of France. Thirdly, and lastly, in some places, as at Amsterdam, Hamburg, Venus, etc., foreign bills of exchange are paid in what they call bank money, while in others, as at London, Lisbon, Antwerp, Leghorn, etc., they are paid in the common currency of the country. What is called bank money is always of more value than the same nominal sum of common currency. A thousand guilders in the Bank of Amsterdam, for example, are of more value than a thousand guilders of Amsterdam currency. The difference between them is called the agio of the bank, which at Amsterdam is generally about 5%. Supposing the current money of the two countries equally near to the standard of their respective mints, and that the one pays foreign bills in this common currency, while the other pays them in bank money, it is evident that the computed exchange may be in favor of that which pays in bank money, though the real exchange should be in favor of that which pays in current money. For the same reason that the computed exchange may be in favor of that which pays in better money, or in money nearer to its own standard, though the real exchange should be in favor of that which pays in worse. The computed exchange, before the late reformation of the gold coin, was generally against London with Amsterdam, Hamburg, Venice, and, I believe, with all other places which pay in what is called bank money. It will by no means follow, however, that the real exchange was against it. 
since the reformation of the gold coin, it has been in favor of London, even with those places. The computed exchange has generally been in favor of London, with Lisbon, Antwerp, Leghorn, and, if you accept France, I believe with most other parts of Europe that pay in common currency, and it is not improbable that the real exchange was so too. Digression concerning banks of deposit, particularly concerning that of Amsterdam. The currency of a great state, such as France or England, generally consists almost entirely of its own coin. Should this currency, therefore, be at any time worn, clipped, or otherwise degraded below its standard value, the state, by a reformation of its coin, can effectually re-establish its currency. But the currency of a small state, such as Genoa or Hamburg, can seldom consist altogether in its own coin but must be made up in a great measure of the coins of all the neighboring states with which its inhabitants have a continual intercourse such a state therefore by reforming its coin will not always be able to reform its currency if foreign bills of exchange are paid in this currency the uncertain value of any sum of what is in its own nature so uncertain must render the exchange always very much against such a state its currency being in all foreign states necessarily valued even below what it is worth. In order to remedy the inconvenience to which this disadvantageous exchange must have subjected their merchants, such small states, when they began to attend to the interest of trade, have frequently enacted that foreign bills of exchange of a certain value should be paid, not in common currency, but by an order upon, or by a transfer in the books of a certain bank, established upon the credit and under the protection of the state, this bank being always obliged to pay, in good and true money, exactly according to the standard of the state. The banks of Venice, Genoa, Amsterdam, Hamburg, and Nuremberg seem to have been all originally established with this view, though some of them may have afterwards been made subservient to other purposes. The money of such banks, being better than the common currency of the country, necessarily bore an agio, which was greater or smaller, according as the currency was supposed to be more or less degraded below the standard of the state. The agio of the Bank of Hamburg, for example, which is said to be commonly about 14%, is the supposed difference between the good standard money of the state and the clipped, worn, and diminished currency poured into it from all the neighboring states. Before 1609, the great quantity of clipped and worn foreign coin, which the extensive trade of Amsterdam brought from all parts of Europe, reduced the value of its currency about 9% below that of good money fresh from the mint. Such money no sooner appeared than it was melted down or carried away, as it always is in such circumstances. The merchants, with plenty of currency, could not always find a sufficient quantity of good money to pay their bills of exchange, and the value of those bills, in spite of several regulations which were made to prevent it, became in a great measure uncertain. In order to remedy these inconveniencies, a bank was established in 1609 under the guarantee of the city. This bank received both foreign coin and the light and worn coin of the country at its real intrinsic value in the good standard money of the country, deducting only so much as was necessary for defraying the expense of coinage and the other necessary expense of management. For the value which remained after this small deduction was made, it gave a credit in its books. This credit was called bank money which, as it represented money exactly according to the standard of the mint, was always of the same real value and intrinsically worth more than current money. It was, at the same time, enacted that all bills drawn upon or negotiated at Amsterdam, of the value of six hundred guilders and upwards, should be paid in bank money, which at once took away all uncertainty in the value of those bills. Every merchant, in consequence of this regulation, was obliged to keep an account with the bank, in order to pay his foreign bills of exchange, which necessarily occasioned a certain demand for bank money. Bank money, over and above both its intrinsic superiority to currency, and the additional value which this demand necessarily gives it, has likewise some other advantages. It is secure from fire, robbery, and other accidents. The city of Amsterdam is bound for it, it can be paid away by a simple transfer without the trouble of counting or the risk of transporting it from one place to another. In consequence of those different advantages, it seems from the beginning to have borne an agio, 
and it is generally believed that all the money originally deposited in the bank was allowed to remain there, nobody caring to demand payment of a debt which he could sell for a premium in the market. By demanding payment of the bank, the owner of a bank credit would lose this premium. As a shilling fresh from the mint will buy no more goods in the market than one of our common worn shillings, so the good and true money which might be brought from the coffers of the bank into those of a private person, being mixed and confounded with the common currency of the country, would be of no more value than that currency from which it could no longer be readily distinguished. While it remained in the coffers of the bank, its superiority was known and ascertained. When it had come into those of a private person, its superiority could not well be ascertained without more trouble than perhaps the difference was worth. By being brought from the coffers of the bank, besides, it lost all the other advantages of bank money, its security, its easy and safe transferability, its use in paying foreign bills of exchange. Over and above all this, it could not be brought from those coffers, as will appear by and by, without previously paying for the keeping. Those deposits of coin, or those deposits which the bank was bound to restore in coin, constituted the original capital of the bank, or the whole value of what was represented by what is called bank money. At present they are supposed to constitute but a very small part of it. In order to facilitate the trade in bullion, the bank has been for these many years in the practice of giving credit in its books upon deposits of gold and silver bullion. This credit is generally about 5% below the mint price of such bullion. The bank grants at the same time what is called a recipice, or receipt, entitling the person who makes the deposit, or the bearer, to take out the bullion again at any time within six months, upon transferring to the bank a quantity of bank money equal to that for which credit had been given in its books when the deposit was made, and upon paying one-fourth percent for the keeping if the deposit was in silver, and one-half percent if it was in gold but at the same time declaring that in default of such payment and upon the expiration of this term the deposit should belong to the bank at the price at which it had been received or for which credit had been given in the transfer books what is thus paid for the keeping of the deposit may be considered as a sort of warehouse rent and why this warehouse rent should be so much dearer for gold than for silver several different reasons have been assigned the fineness of gold it has been said is more difficult to be ascertained than that of silver frauds are more easily practised and occasion a greater loss in the most precious metal silver besides being the standard metal the state it has been said wishes to encourage more the making of deposits of silver than those of gold deposits of bullion are most commonly made when the price is somewhat lower than ordinary and they are taken out again when it happens to rise in holland the market price of bullion is generally above the mint price for the same reason that it was so in england before the late reformation of the gold coin the difference is said to be commonly from about six to sixteen stivers upon the mark or eight ounces of silver of eleven parts of fine and one part alloy the bank price or the credit which the bank gives for the deposits of such silver when made in foreign coin of which the fineness is well known and ascertained such as mexico dollars is twenty two guilders the mark the mint price is about twenty three guilders and the market price is from twenty three guilders six to twenty three guilders sixteen stivers or from two to three per cent above the mint price bar or ingot gold is received in proportion to its fineness compared with the above foreign gold coin upon fine bars the bank gives three hundred and forty per mark in general however something more is given upon coin of a known fineness than upon gold and silver bars of which the fineness cannot be ascertained but by a process of melting and assaying the proportions between the bank price the mint price and the market price of gold bullion are nearly the same a person can generally sell his receipt for the difference between the mint price of bullion and the market price a receipt for bullion is almost always worth something and it very seldom happens therefore that anybody suffers his receipts to expire or allows his bullion to fall to the bank at the price at which it had been received either by not taking it out before the end of the six months or by neglecting to pay one-fourth or one-half per cent in order to obtain a new receipt for another six months 
This, however, though it happens seldom, is said to happen sometimes, and more frequently, with regard to gold than with regard to silver, on account of the higher warehouse rent which is paid for the keeping of the more precious metal. The person who, by making a deposit of bullion, obtains both a bank credit and a receipt, pays his bills of exchange as they became due with his bank credit, and either sells or keeps his receipt according as he judges that the price of bullion is likely to rise or to fall. The receipt and the bank credit seldom keep long together, and there is no occasion that they should. The person who has a receipt and who wants to take out bullion finds always plenty of bank credits or bank money to buy at the ordinary price and the person who has bank money and wants to take out bullion finds receipts always in equal abundance the owners of bank credits and the holders of receipts constitute two different sorts of creditors against the bank the holder of a receipt cannot draw out the bullion for which it is granted without reassigning to the bank a sum of bank money equal to the price at which the bullion had been received if he has no bank money of his own, he must purchase it of those who have it. The owner of bank money cannot draw out bullion without producing to the bank receipts for the quantity which he wants. If he has none of his own, he must buy them of those who have them. The holder of a receipt, when he purchases bank money, purchases the power of taking out a quantity of bullion, of which the mint price is 5% above the bank price. The agio of 5%, therefore, which he commonly pays for it, is paid not for an imaginary, but for a real value. The owner of bank money, when he purchases a receipt, purchases the power of taking out a quantity of bullion, of which the market price is commonly from 2 to 3% above the mint price. The price which he pays for it, therefore, is paid likewise for a real value. The price of the receipt and the price of the bank money compound or make up between them the full value or price of the bullion. Upon deposits of the coin current in the country, the bank grants receipts likewise, as well as bank credits. But those receipts are frequently of no value and will bring no price in the market. Upon ducatoons, for example, which in the currency pass for three guilders, three stivers each, the bank gives a credit of three guilders only or five per cent below their current value. It grants a receipt, likewise, entitling the bearer to take out the number of ducatoons deposited at any time within six months, upon paying one-fourth per cent for the keeping. This receipt will frequently bring no price in the market. Three guilders bank money generally sell in the market for three guilders three stivers, the full value of the ducatoons if they were taken out of the bank and before they can be taken out, one-fourth per cent must be paid for the keeping, which would be mere loss to the holder of the receipt. If the agio of the bank, however, should at any time fall to three per cent, such receipts might bring some price in the market, and might sell for one and three-fourths per cent. But the agio of the bank being now generally about five per cent, such receipts are frequently allowed to expire, or, as they express it, to fall to the bank. The receipts which are given for deposits of gold ducats fall to it yet more frequently, because a higher warehouse rent, or one-half per cent, must be paid for the keeping of them before they can be taken out again. The five per cent which the bank gains, when deposits either of coin or bullion are allowed to fall to it, may be considered as the warehouse rent for the perpetual keeping of such deposits. The sum of bank money for which the receipts are expired must be very considerable, it must comprehend the whole original capital of the bank, which, it is generally supposed, has been allowed to remain there from the time it was first deposited, nobody caring either to renew his receipt or to take out his deposit, as, for the reasons already assigned, neither the one nor the other could be done without loss. But whatever may be the amount of this sum, the proportion which it bears to the whole mass of bank money is supposed to be very small. The Bank of Amsterdam has, for these many years past, been the great warehouse of Europe for bullion, for which the receipts are very seldom allowed to expire, or, as they express it, to fall to the bank. The far greater part of the bank money, or of the credits upon the books of the bank, is supposed to have been created, for these many years past, by such deposits which the dealers in bullion are continually both making and withdrawing. No demand can be made upon the bank but by means of a recipice or receipt. The smaller mass of bank money, for which the receipts are expired, is mixed and confounded with the much greater mass for which they are still in force, 
so that, though there may be a considerable sum of bank money, for which there are no receipts, there is no specific sum or portion of it which may not at any time be demanded by one. The bank cannot be debtor to two persons for the same thing, and the owner of bank money who has no receipt cannot demand payment of the bank till he buys one. In ordinary and quiet times, he can find no difficulty in getting one to buy at the market price, which generally corresponds with the price at which he can sell the coin or bullion it entitles him to take out of the bank. It might be otherwise during a public calamity, an invasion, for example, such as that of the French in 1672. The owners of bank money being then all eager to draw it out of the bank, in order to have it in their own keeping, the demand for receipts might raise their price to an exorbitant height the holders of them might form extravagant expectations and instead of two or three per cent demand half the bank money for which credit had been given upon the deposits that the receipts had respectively been granted for the enemy informed of the constitution of the bank might even buy them up in order to prevent the carrying away of the treasure in such emergencies the bank it is supposed would break through its ordinary rule of making payment only to the holders of receipts the holders of receipts who had no bank money must have received within two or three per cent of the value of the deposit for which their respective receipts had been granted the bank therefore it is said would in this case make no scruple of paying either with money or bullion the full value of what the owners of bank money who could get no receipts were credited for in its books paying at the same time two or three per cent to such holders of receipts as had no bank money that being the whole value which in this state of things could justly be supposed due them even in the ordinary and quiet times it is the interest of the holders of receipts to depress the agio in order either to buy bank money and consequently the bullion which their receipts would then enable them to take out of the bank so much cheaper or to sell their receipts to those who have bank money and who want to take out bullion so much dearer the price of a receipt being generally equal to the difference between the market price of bank money and that of the coin or bullion for which the receipt had been granted it is the interest of the owners of bank money on the contrary to raise the agio in order either to sell the bank money so much dearer or to buy a receipt so much cheaper to prevent the stock jobbing tricks which those opposite interests might sometimes occasion the bank has of late years come to the resolution to sell at all times bank money for currency at five per cent agio and to buy it again at four per cent agio in consequence of this resolution the agio can never either rise above five or sink below four per cent and the proportion between the market price of bank and that of current money is kept at all times very near the proportion between their intrinsic values before this resolution was taken, the market price of bank money used sometimes to rise so high as 9% agio, and sometimes to sink so low as par, according as opposite interest happened to influence the market. The Bank of Amsterdam professes to lend out no part of what is deposited with it, but for every guilder for which it gives credit in its books, to keep in its repositories the value of a guilder either in money or bullion that it keeps in its repositories all the money or bullion for which there are receipts in force for which it is at all times liable to be called upon and which in reality is continually going from it and returning to it again cannot well be doubted but whether it does so likewise with regard to that part of its capital for which the receipts are long ago expired for which in ordinary and quiet times it cannot be called upon and which in reality is very likely to remain with it for ever or as long as the states of the united provinces subsist may perhaps appear more uncertain at amsterdam however no point of faith is better established than that for every guilder circulated as bank money there is a correspondent guilder in gold or silver to be found in the treasures of the bank the city is guaranteed that it should be so the bank is under the direction of the four reigning burgomasters who are changed every year each new set of burgomasters visits the treasure compares it with the books receives it upon oath and delivers it over with the same awful solemnity to the set which succeeds and in that sober and religious country oaths are not yet disregarded a rotation of this kind seems alone a sufficient security against any practices which cannot be avowed amidst all the revolutions which faction has ever occasioned in the government of amsterdam 
the prevailing party has at no time accused their predecessors of infidelity in the administration of the bank. No accusation could have affected more deeply the reputation and fortune of the disgraced party, and if such an accusation could have been supported, we may be assured that it would have been brought. In 1672, when the French king was at Utrecht, the bank of Amsterdam paid so readily as left no doubt of the fidelity with which it had observed its engagements. Some of the pieces which were then brought from its repositories appeared to have been scorched with the fire which happened in the town house soon after the bank was established. Those pieces, therefore, must have lain there from that time. What may be the amount of the treasure in the bank is a question which has long employed the speculations of the curious. Nothing but conjecture can be offered concerning it. It is generally reckoned that there are about two thousand people who keep accounts with the bank, and allowing them to have, one with another, the value of fifteen hundred pounds sterling lying upon their respective accounts, a very large allowance, the whole quantity of bank money, and consequently of treasure in the bank, will amount to about three million pounds sterling, or, at eleven guilders the pound sterling, thirty-three million of guilders a great sum and sufficient to carry on a very extensive circulation but vastly below the extravagant ideas which some people have formed of this treasure the city of amsterdam derives a considerable revenue from the bank besides what may be called the warehouse rent above mentioned each person upon first opening an account with the bank pays a fee of ten guilders and for every new account three guilders three stivers for every transfer two stivers and if the transfer is for less than three hundred guilders, six stivers, in order to discourage the multiplicity of small transactions. The person who orders a transfer for more than is upon his account is obliged to pay three per cent for the sum overdrawn, and his order is set aside into the bargain. The bank is supposed, too, to make a considerable profit by the sale of the foreign coin or bullion which sometimes falls to it by the expiring of receipts, and which is always kept till it can be sold with advantage. It makes a profit likewise by selling bank money at five per cent agio, and buying it in at four. These different emoluments amount to a good deal more than what is necessary for paying the salaries of officers, and defraying the expense of management. What is paid for the keeping of bullion upon receipts, is alone supposed to amount to a neat annual revenue of between one hundred and fifty thousand and two hundred thousand guilders. Public utility, however, and not revenue, was the original object of this institution. Its object was to relieve the merchants from the inconvenience of a disadvantageous exchange. The revenue which has arisen from it was unforeseen, and may be considered accidental. But it is now time to return from this long digression, into which I have been insensibly led, in endeavouring to explain the reasons why the exchange between the countries which pay in what is called bank money, and those which pay in common currency, should generally appear to be in favor of the former and against the latter. The former pay in a species of money, of which the intrinsic value is always the same, and exactly agreeable to the standard of their respective mints. The latter is a species of money, of which the intrinsic value is continually varying, and is almost always more or less below that standard. End of Book 4, Chapter 3, Part A